And he tells Garfield that you know, what he's doing now and where he's at and the opportunity here if he could build a railroad line. He said, now I can take care of all the legal work. I can buy all the land needed. I can do all the hiring. I can do all the engineering if you put up the money. And then we can split it. I'll do the work. You put up the money. Uh, so they came to an agreement. I don't know what the mix was or how they were going to split the profits. Uh, but Garfield ended up putting up the money. And we ran a, a railroad line, and, and the railroad line was called the Stub End Line. I almost forgot it there for a second. The Stub End Line, just a weird name. Uh, it started right there south of uh, where Broadway Tap is. Uh, it's the one that runs. Uh, actually, the, there's an old pillar you can still see when you cross the bridge if you look down. Old sandstone pillar there across from St. Mary Cemetery. That's where it crossed the river. It went through what is now St. Mary Cemetery and angled southwest to Winona. I don't know why he went to Winona instead of Lawson, because Lawson would have been a straight shot, unless maybe some of the land wasn't available. Uh, but anyway, that's where he went. They eventually, uh, when St. Mary Cemetery started up, they had to go around the cemetery, uh, so it went around what was we used to call the new pool, went around the pool <laughs> and cut through Riverview Cemetery. And right before you get to Spring Lake Road, it crossed 23 in angle. Uh, and if you, as you're going out on Route 18 to the west, if you look to your left, you can still, all the telephone poles are still there running electricity out to Winona. And that was where the line went. Uh, now those old steam engines, uh, they were very heavy. They were made out of cast iron. If you've ever lifted up a cast iron pan, you know how heavy cast iron is. Well, these, these steam engines, locomotives, were made out of cast iron. They were very heavy. Uh, they were run on steam, and it took a lot of water and a lot of steam to get that much weight to move. And even much worse when you had, you know, cars full of coal behind them. Uh, so they could only go 8 to 10 miles on a tank of water. And the problem was Winona was 17 miles away. So they had to build a railroad station halfway. And they built, built that station. Uh, it was started out as a watering station, became a, uh, a full-fledged train station. A uh, little town grew up around it. Had a bank, it had a couple of saloons. Uh, had three to 400 people living there. And that was Garfield, Illinois. Uh, the only thing left in Garfield now is a grain elevator in one house. And there's still a sign that says Garfield there when you, when you go the back way to uh, Tawasset. He named it Garfield because Garfield put up the money. And that was his tribute to his good friend, James Garfield, as he named that town after him. And it was a thriving town for a long time. Uh, the town kind of squeaked out when trains got more efficient and didn't have to stop to get it water. And uh, then it just became nothing but a grain elevator, and the town just kind of squeaked out after that. Uh, but once he had that railroad, all of a sudden, he was selling coal like crazy. And now he had the opposite problem. He couldn't harvest enough coal to match what he was selling. He sent salesmen out to the big cities and to the factories and blacksmiths everywhere, showing them samples of our coal. And they were coming back with orders like crazy. And so he's selling it and he's shipping it out. And so he needs a second shaft. He drops the, the uh, Vermilion Coal Mine Company, shaft number two. Uh, and this one, he went big. He went way down. He got into that second vein. Uh, the, the, the Vermilion Coal Company, shaft number two, was just northeast of would be Grant and Vermilion Street. And... Like I said, he went big. This was a 24 hour a day, six day a week operation. And now his problem was, how do I get enough workers? Coal miners in little towns like Standard and Winona and Colville and Heenanville, they're all dropping their pickaxes there and they're coming to Streeter because the coal's easy pickets. I mean, because you get down to that big shaft and coal miners got paid by the ton of coal they got out. They got, at this time, they were getting nine cents a ton. Doesn't sound like much money. So in these small towns, in these small, you've got to work real hard to get little nuggets of coal to have. Well, now there's a fresh 
coal mine with a six foot vein, it's easy to get a lot of ton of coal. And that's where the term easy pickings comes from. Because uh, it was easy with your pickaxe to get a whole bunch of coal. And so miners are flocking this field at Unionville. And they're, they're flocking here like crazy. And, and we went from 200 to 500 to 1,000 people in no time. Houses are popping up everywhere. Plum's getting rich. Uh, not only is he making money off the of Vermilion Coal Company, now he's making money off the railroad. He extends his railroad a little further to the east, so now he's, uh, so he can use it for the Vermilion Coal Company, no chat number two. Uh, he talks other companies into running railroad lines here. Within a matter of a few years, there are seven different lines coming through Streeter. So uh, now he can sell coal anywhere in the world he wants to. He can get it out. Uh, he personally owns three of those coal mines, or three of those railroads at this point. Uh, Vermilion Coal Company starts opening up more shafts. At the same time, he's got a concern about the money. Because now he's getting two shipments a week from the bank in Ottawa. There's no bank in Streeter. And by 1867, 1868, he's concerned about the payroll company. It's going to get robbed, and it's, he needs a bank here in town. Well, he's got a brother, Sam Plum. Uh, Sam Plum was a baker, banker in Oberlin, Ohio. Uh, and they had a common nephew from another, from Theron, uh, Fawcett Plum. Uh, that was working at the same bank that Sam Plum was. Fawcett Plum was a real estate guy there. Well, he gets Sam to come here to open up a bank. Uh, he's, yeah, he writes to him and he convinces him, we need a bank here, you're, you know what you're doing. Uh, and I always wondered, was Sam in Oberlin and got Plum to move to Oberlin, or did Plum go to Oberlin and then his brother Sam ended up moving there? I never did figure that out. I, I've never researched Sam Plum enough to find out when he moved to Oberlin which was which. But anyway, he gets Sam to come here, and he brings Fawcett Plum with him. Uh, Fawcett was the favorite nephew of Colonel Plum. Uh, he, Plum hires him to be his personal assistant. And so now, not only did we get a bank when Sam Plum came, he started up the Unionville Bank. And it started out as the Unionville Bank uh, when it was a privately owned bank. Uh, later on, in 1874, when he applied for a national charter for the bank, he dropped the bill off of it and became Union Bank. And, and that's, but when it was privately owned, he was calling it Unionville Bank. Um, anyway, he, he brings Fawcett with him. Now, Fawcett's a real estate guy, and that was another problem we were having. People were coming here, and there was nowhere for him to live. 